having impact on how the, the city runs versus uh, depth. So you, do you have breadth or do you have depth? You work in a few places on the full range of cross-sectoral issues that are required if you really want to take a city focus. And then if you're only talking about five or maybe a dozen cities or towns out of 200 or 400, are you really having systemic change? It's already been acknowledged the short-term horizon of donor programs. Uh, the reality is our, our objectives tend to be on a time three-year time frame, five-year at best, and these are long-term problems with long-term solutions. And if we're going to focus on improving and strengthening systems and institutions, that is very much a long-term endeavor. Capacity building does not happen overnight. Um, and I think Mila made reference to the MDG regarding 100 million slum dwellers. If we look at the projections for urban growth rates and we're going to have 1 billion slum dwellers in coming decades, it's a meaningless target. How can we possibly um, deal with that and if we're talking about three or five year time frames at best? Again, the project mentality. It's a, a system or a process is designed for the specific project. Um, we sometimes might have multiple donors developing participatory planning processes in the same country, going to the same sets of local governments. Um, not very constructive. And that's where you, we need to go back to having municipalities, local governments, and the national government in the driver's seat. They define the agenda, and that means stepping up to the plate. Um, drive the agenda, and the donors support that process, not create it. Um, and it's hard then to say we're not going to do anything here because the political will is absent. Um, Congress for USA doesn't always like that. So those are realities. Um, donors tend to be reactive, particularly you, I think my, my own agency, then proactive. We react to disasters uh, after the tsunami, after uh, the hurricanes in Central America, um, Disaster mitigation and management was important. Why hadn't anyone thought about this? Well, no, people thought about it. Certainly urban planners thought about it, but that's certainly one of the first things to go when you're talking about uh, what are your priorities when there are children dying today from lack of access to clean water or because they didn't get uh, vaccinations. That's a much easier argument to make than to say, well, there might be another tsunami 100 years from now, or there might be another massive hurricane 10 years from now. Um, those are difficult to do, but realities of what we face. Um, so it's easier said than done. Across the board, it's very easy for me to stand up here and say what I think should be done. Working within the bureaucracy, I know it's a whole lot harder to make that happen. Um, Sustainability is not easy. Political will doesn't just happen. Leadership is not created by donors. Um, and cross-sectoral approaches are very complex. It's very hard to get folks to work together. It's very hard to say, well, we can help you achieve your HIV AIDS objectives better if you work with the folks strengthening local government capacity. Well, I don't see that. So how do, you, how do you make that happen? And I didn't put it up here, and I should have, donor coordination. Another thing I, I spent a lot of years <laughs> while I was uh, at Post working on, and it was an incredible headache and a frustration. There are bureaucratic and institutional realities that are just very hard to overcome. And when you're talking about the urban agenda or a decentralization agenda, one donor may be interested in health, Another may be interested in education. Someone else has a, has a democracy program. It's not a pretty picture, and it's not easily done. So what does USAID do? The kinds of programs I already talked about, we do a lot of. And as I said, are mostly under our democracy and governance portfolios. We do some activities under an economic growth umbrella. We have health programs that certainly work in urban areas. We have on the books, a strategy called Making Cities Work that dates back to 2000, and it is a strategy that sits on the books. It's not something that has been embraced by leadership at USAID. Um, 
it doesn't really hold much traction, but it is very much a strategy that argues for uh, cross-sectoral approaches and, and argues for addressing urban poverty, urban service delivery issues. Um, so as I said, technical assistance training and credit programs kind of under other names than urban. We did an urban report for Congress a few years back, and when we pieced the puzzle together and kind of dug through the weeds to see what aid was really doing, it was an awful lot when you added it up all added all of it up together. But I think as Susan said, there there are limitations to that approach to doing it cross sectorally, maybe in urban, or excuse me, doing it sectorally maybe in urban, or having another agenda and maybe where you operate is at the municipal or local government level. For those of you who are unaware of the new framework for U.S. foreign assistance, we have five objectives. Peace and security, governing justly, economic growth, investing in people, and humanitarian assistance. I don't believe there is anywhere in the framework, which underneath is a endless numbers of elements and sub-elements that, that go down to a, a very low level, is the word urban, does the word urban appear? Now, one could say, again, if you're cross-sectoral, well, we're embedded, we're a part of that, and there is some value in saying that this is, that, we sh that urban should be a piece of everything, but there are risks in that. Um, another part of our new framework is, is transformational diplomacy, and within that rubric of moving countries across the development continuum, uh, there are five country categories, developing, rebuilding, transitioning, sustaining, and I forget. And then, then there's the others, you know, Cuba and Zimbabwe and folks that we kind of lump together because they don't play nice with the U.S. government. But um, <laughs> USAID is supposed to prioritize now on developing and rebuilding countries, while other U.S. government agencies uh, focus, such as the Millennium Challenge Corporation, take responsibility for transitional and sustaining countries. Uh, the reality of the current aid environment is that we are very heavily focused on rebuilding countries and a select handful, which constrains very much how we operate. Um, I think there is considerable value in our effort to develop a whole of government approach to what we do, just as donors need to coordinate, just as at a municipal level we need to work cross-sectorally, U.S. government should be more coordinated in its approach. We should have an overlying objective. I think one of the greatest um, weaknesses or problems uh, with our framework is that it very much encourages stovepiping, and it, it does not create incentives at a minimum uh, for cross-sectoral programming. Uh, just one last point, because um, I think going back to Richard's comments, the, to, to, to give a little more reality to the, to, the, to the statement that there is a declining funding for, for all things urban and a lot of donors, um, just very quickly, for USAID, and many have heard this before, uh, in the 1990s, with the Re Regional Urban Development Office and our programs, our RUDOs, our Regional Urban Development Offices in the field, at its peak, we had about 40 expatriate staff and I, some untold number of local professionals. In, during the course of its history, 10 regional offices and our, and our Washington office. We, are, we closed all of the RUDOs in 2001. The final RUDOs were closed. And Aid Washington is now down to seven. So as a little anecdote of of how things are going. So, what's the future? Um, <laughs> we, we continue to, to fight the good fight at USAID. Um, but I think, and this is now speaking from my personal opinion, not something I pretend that I can make happen, but uh, maybe when I'm back out in the field and running a DG program, because that's more real than anything else, uh, is donors need to really move away from being the providers of technical assistance and training and focus more on building local and regional capacity and building local institutions to provide those services on a continuing basis. I think we shy away from civil service reform. We shy away from working with public government institutes for local government officials. We shy away from really um, working enough with local academia and, and other and as I said, with associations. 
We need improved donor coordination and greater support in a real way to national policies and the agendas of host country counterparts. I think the emergency, emergence of the Cities Alliance has helped, but we need an awful lot more. Um, and there needs to be a greater role for the private sector, as I said, in the financing and delivery of urban services. And we need to continue to advocate to, de to develop comprehensive cross-sectoral programs. And then last, um, a focus on best, tra best practices transfer programs, which can be part of the agenda of a local association or some other national institution, which would be, as I said, south-south transfer. If a city in uh, Columbia, for example, has great public transportation, enough talking about it, help to bring folks there to see and bring that back um, and learn because mayors learn from mayors, whether they are mayors from the U.S. or they mayors south to south. The public official running the finance department learns. The solution may not be exactly, we're not, not talking about transferring it whole scale, but learning and asking the right questions and figuring out how they went through that process and how to get the buy-in. Um, so the South-South partnerships and technical twinning arrangements and support for local, regional, and international organizations such as United Cities and local governments and its member organizations. Um, it's, a, it's a nascent organization, but one that is deserving of attention and I think we need to do as donors more. And the folks that we refer to but don't have a voice, the urban poor, um, organization like Slum Dwellers International, and a number of donors are actually via the, the Cities Alliance members, uh, organization are beginning to look at how to really provide support to an organization that is very different than donors are used to working with and is very much a grassroots bottom-up organization. And so those are some of our challenges. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any comments or questions directed specifically at the panel? We'll, we'll get you a microphone right now. We'll come down here and please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Shohini Sarkar from CHF International. My question is for Jessica. You sort of in your last slide addressed a little bit of what I was thinking through the entire presentation. Um, you know, USAID it seems like is focusing definitely on the local government level and which is a valid and legitimate object of attention and you know, in the larger scheme of decentralization and that's where a lot of action happens. But I was wondering, this entire civil society part, you did mention, you know, private sector and the local governance part. But what's happening to the emphasis on civil society? Because, you know, I'm speaking from my experience with India, which is where we have programming with USAID uh, in Ahmedabad, actually with the SY2SP program, is you can have a very efficient municipal government. But, you know, we are talking about people who probably pay a lot more for water, but don't necessarily pay taxes. We are talking about people who do not have a role in the electoral process, which often you know, is a very important political component of who gets what. So what is the check and balances to make sure that the voices of these people are actually articulated in the urban planning process? And how can we incentivize urban governments, the local governments, who actually participate in inclusive planning. Because if you look at the real estate markets, they can actually make more profits and they can be, you know, short-term efficiencies are higher, um, not through the distributive growth strategies, but through like immediate growth strategies. You give the land off to a real estate developer and they have a high income, you know, stuff coming up. So is USAID actually, mo uh, like, has there been a reconsideration in terms of the focus and it's now the local governments who are the only objects of focus or the civil society focus you think is going to come back and be a more balanced approach? If you want to go ahead and, why don't we, we don't have a huge number of questions. Why don't, you, why don't you answer her directly and then we'll collect. I think we have about four other questions. That's a very good question and um, in my notes, but I rushed through it, didn't properly address it. Um, civil society, I mean, if you think about it, it, 
it's government, private sector, and civil society tends to be the three legs we talk about. And um, we often at USAID think of our civil society programs as something separate and not part of a comprehensive local governance package. Um, from, from where I had been operating, we, we tried to remedy that and designed a, a comprehensive program that said we need to work at the local level with local government, elected officials, civil society, the media, um, and, and, and address all of those. Again, trying to do anything that's really comprehensive um, and even within a DG perspective is cross-sectoral tends to be difficult. I don't know how many examples there are out there. Civil society strengthening is very much a part and parcel of USAID's democracy and governance approach in order to provide the balance to government to demand accountability, to demand transparency um, within our sectoral programs. If you're talking about health, if you're talking about water, uh, establishing user groups or establishing community-based organizations, again, to advocate or to demand accountability is, is part and parcel of what we do. do. Do we do it in a sufficiently organized manner? Probably not. Um, and. Uh, Personally, one of the things I found very challenging, and, and I think it was Susan that, that commented this, how do you talk about participation of 5 to 10 million people? One of the frustrations I ran into a lot was we tended to think of participatory planning as these little bottom-up planning activities. So you meet at the, at the urban village level in your own neighborhood, and you, you talk about what my priorities are. Well, okay, my priorities are a footpath or communal latrines or something like that versus city planning, talking about where are the roads going to go, how much are we investing in a water utility plant, and how did you make those two really happen? And I, I honestly don't have a very good answer. And I think that's where we need to do some of our research is, is we, we've invested a lot in participatory rural development. We've not invested anything in understanding in an urban environment, if you're talking about a disenfranchised and very large population, how do you create those linkages how do you further encourage um, folks engaging in elections? How do you, you know, you, you've got to actually be a, a, an official resident of the city. You, you've got to live somewhere. You have to have an ID card or whatever it may be to actually go to the polling station. So it's a very legitimate question, and I think one we all need to, to think about more. I'll point out as a preview for after lunch, the case of Brazil will, will be discussed, and I think some of these issues will come up in the context of very large cities. Um, there are about a half dozen questions. Let's start. I, I know Ray has had his hand up, and this gentleman here. We have a couple of questions here and a couple of questions Just back. Let's. A couple of one for each, if I may. Mila, uh, you know this cross-sectoral this problem that you've got to go across sector, and the world is organized by sector. The donors are organized by sector. You know, the PSRP process is designed exactly to address that. And so, you know, why not have, you know, sort of a parallel process within the bank, which is its coordination, it's cross-sectoral, and it could, it's something everybody knows now, so it would be relatively simple in the great scope of things to just transfer that model. Maybe it's been thought of and rejected for lots of good reasons. Um, on, uh, for Jessica, you know, this... Uh, one of the points everybody makes is a need for more capacity building at the at the local level, and you look at the inter, you know the international budget pro project, the I IBP, and uh, now you look at the transparency and accountability project that's being funded by Hewlett, uh, being done at Brookings. Uh, those are targeted, uh, independent monitoring or policy research organization capacity building programs. And they target specific sectors. Why not have a similar one for the, those organizations to encourage local policy research organizations to take on the urban issues and develop the capacity? So you've got, you know, there are a few around, the Institute for Urban Economics in Moscow that, that, that Blair knows and some of the other people here know. But that's, that's a model that, that now has a fair, amount of, uh, a fair amount of experience. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a question right down here, Joe, this gentleman right here on the aisle. Yes. Thank you. I'm Daniel Esser from UNDP. We're the folks who uh, keep raving about the importance of associations of local government. <laughs> you need to fund uh, it more. <laughs> okay, I pass this on. <laughs> uh, I have a question for both of you, for, for the panelists. Um, 
Because I think um, when I'm, I, I was trying to connect uh, the first panel with the second panel, and for me there really seemed to be two elephants in the room, in a sense. Um, two very simple questions. In light of what we've heard already, and also in light of the fact that all four panelists have to some degree either implicitly or explicitly underlined the importance of, of growth and of inclusive growth, how do we go about urban production and how do we go about urban politics and particularly the politics of production and distribution of wealth in the city? How do we go about production? How do we go about politics? Um, because I think from my own experience in cities such as Freetown and Kabul, these two issues are really at the core. Of course, service delivery and all that is extremely important, but ultimately it's about where does the money come from and who decides where the money goes to and how do we deal with that? Okay, I think we have some big and small questions on the table. Um, I will say that some of these larger questions perhaps might be addressed better in a more general discussion, but they've been asked. So why don't we see what we can do with these two questions. Um, what we will then do, so everybody knows, because we're just about out of time before lunch, we'll take two questions here and two questions there, uh, and, and then you can answer whichever ones you want. But why don't, we, why don't we deal with the four questions on the table already? Mila, do you want to go first? Uh, on the PRSP, you know, thank you very much. I think it's a very good, interesting question. Yes, you know, the, the PRSP is, a, is an integrated framework where you have the poverty of a nation and the, you know, the actions. And uh, you know, it, it's, the space is not there, so it's one of the questions why urban is not there. And you have, you know, majorly is the education, health, you know, sanitation, I just really to look at the very, and uh, we are really doing a very good work, especially on five uh, African countries where really we are working with the PRSSP team to, to uh, put you know, urban and with all the specificity what is urban you know, in the map. So you know, uh, 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 there is hope and I'm sure that you know, in another two years we'll have a methodology more refined on the PRSP on the space uh, side. In terms of, you know, of the, the urban politics, uh, I think it's one of the most difficult areas, and is where donors, you know, are a little bit, you know, do not have the instruments. For example, the work that you know, I've been doing shows that really uh, uh, power structures and uh, everyone knows that, you know, one of the major problems we have in cities is, is land and land markets. And land markets, you know, are the most difficult because, you know, you really, you, you know, the political structure, you know, absorbs, you know, just captures the rents of the, of the land. So many times, you know, in Kibera, the problem of, of, of Nairobi is a political problem. It's, it's a land tenure problem. It's, you know, 95%, you know, of the slums that, that really they pay rent and they pay over rent to access services because, you know, the structure, you know, of, of, the, of the slum. So it's not really so much of economics, but it's a political structure. And there we do not really, know, I, I don't think we are equipped, especially uh, in urban. Is where we be, you know, some kind of... And the, the, the community at large, then you know, we can really start you know, impressing, but you know, from an individual point of view. So in terms of urban production, it's a bit easier because then you can see, you know, you know, we can have you know, investment climate assessments, you know, you can really have a cluster analysis in pure economic terms. We can really understand you know, how city can really position itself to use globalization you know, or incentives you know, or, you know, in order to produce. And you can identify where, really, for example, the doing business are extremely interesting tools to see, you know, why, for example, in Singapore you have just two hours to approve a new uh, bus uh, business permit, while, for example, in uh, Afghanistan it takes, you know, you know, four months. So these are the things that, you know, we have tools and we have diagnosis. But, you know, on the political side, you know, it's extreme, especially in the, in the city environment. But I don't think we have tools. We know what's going on, but I don't think it can be, uh, like, at least my opinion. Mm -hmm. Jessica? Okay. Um, I think on the on the first question, I think that's really more just was more of a comment, and I think one that we would need to look into to understand what the model is you're talking about. Obviously, capacity building, no matter what issue you're talking about, is ongoing. You you hire new mayor, or, excuse me, you elect new mayors all the time. <laughs> we hope we're not hiring mayors, um, <laughs> although that does happen in some countries. Um, mayors are elected, local councilors are elected. Uh, the head of the water utility is, is hired. If people move around within the local civil service, or whatever it may be, you're always needing to train new elected or um, officials or or 
public servants, bureaucrats, you're always going to need to provide capacity building to civil society organizations. Um, so in some countries, you know, on that front, we look at strengthening institution, institutional providers um, as opposed to individual CSOs, civil society organizations. So uh, it's an interesting model that you've raised, and maybe we can talk offline and look more into it. Um, but we, that's the kind of thing we need to do is look at how we're actually um, building things that are, are ongoing and self-sustaining as opposed to project-based. On the, on, the, on the second question, um, well, I think Mila touched on, on something with the, the doing business tools. Whether you're talking about the issues of politics, you're talking about where's the money coming from, where's it going. Um, if you're talking about distribution of wealth, if you're talking about economic growth, it, it is hard for donors, frankly, to, to tackle those issues head on. We're not tackling politics, um, addressing politics. But some of these tools that we have in our, our repertoire of tr tricks, so to, so to speak, can be very powerful, assuming we understand the local context. And that's critical. Um, I think, in, in my opinion, one of USAID's strengths is its local presence, uh, which is currently perhaps a bit at threat at the moment, but um, our, our ability to understand the context, and if you're talking about a post-conflict, certainly folks who work in post-conflict environments, who work on conflict issues, again, it's cross-sectoral. What you need to do is understand where are the sources of conflict, who are the actors, what are their real needs and demands, and how do you address them. So sometimes street lighting or sometimes public transportation or sometimes a local market is enough if you understand what the dynamics of the local situation are and being able to begin to legitimate the the local government, the municipal government, to be able to engage effectively with civil society or local media to begin increasing transparency and accountability to reduce corruption so people do in fact know where the money comes from and where it's being spent are very powerful ways. Um, you know, talking about the doing business, very small things like setting up a one-stop shop for businesses so that they can come in and get their business permits. I know how much I have to pay. I know how long it's going to take me can be very powerful in improving the local business environment. And those are, those are small kind of technical fixes that can address much deeper, larger underlying issues. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Very quickly, the last four questions. These two down here, we'll see how long that takes, and then we're going to go to the two of you in the back. Uh, Hugh Schwartz, uh, the University of the Republic in Uruguay and formerly the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, should uh, donor agency funds be granted primarily in terms of the needs, however defined, uh, of, a, of an urban community or urban communities, or in terms of the success of the results, however defined? Of the re I can think of cases where uh, donor agencies have oriented themselves towards the first and other cases uh, uh, where they've oriented themselves towards the second. Uh, which should it be? Uh, should it be towards the needs where they're greatest or towards the results where the accomplishments are greatest and that serves as a model for others to follow? And right next to you, very quickly. Uh, yeah, Chia Chen, freelance correspondent. To Mena, uh, would you uh, please uh, 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 explain what do you mean the link social and human capital with the infrastructure? To Jessica, I have two comments. You mentioned about three trends, decentralization, urbanization, and globalization. Actually, urbanization and globalization is uh, centralization. And I think nowadays, uh, the urbanization and globalization are the two major forces. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, south-to-south uh, uh, transfer or partnership. I may say that uh, we still need to talk about the uh, north-to-south transfer, and that means uh, the technical uh, assistance. And south-to-south -south is, uh, I think what you mean is uh, ex experience uh, sharing. And I may need it, uh, I think that's uh, very important, is uh, the north-north uh, transfer of uh, partnership. And I think this in uh, uh, coordination and also uh, ex experience uh, sharing. And here I made uh, the question is, is uh, 
what are the nose to nose partnership now? Okay, I think we will take the two questions in the back and then the panelists can choose what they want to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nora Dudwick from the World Bank. Um, all the comments that uh, the bank and other donors don't take on board the, um, the importance of urban poverty really resonate. So here's my question, particularly for the bank and for Mila. Um, to the extent that the bank and other donors start understanding that this is very central, uh, urban poverty, how do you think this would change the growth paradigm, the discourse about growth, in the bank, and specifically how it's articulated, say, in the country assistance strategies or the PRSP. Okay, and right next to you. Thank you. Um, Peter Solis from the Inter-American Development Bank. Just um, two very quick questions relating uh, comments that were made in the first uh, session with comments made in the second session. Mila, you said that one of the issues um, facing, for example, Maputo is a lack of financial resources. But at the same time, Susan was also pointing up the need to build specialist local urban capacity. So what is the, is there a contradiction here, or do we need to look for a balance between the capacity to spend money well and the, and the, and the lack of financial resources? Because we know that in many situations, um, having too many resources can lead to, uh, to weakening of capacity, um, introduction of corruption, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this, the title of the second session was around the role of the international community, and this refers to some of the comments that Richard make, was making in the first session, around um, who the donors were that were supporting the urban agenda in the 70s and the 80s. My sense is that the, the international community supporting, um, say, development issues in the, in, in, in the South are very much more complicated than previously. We have now um, very much larger ph philanthropic organizations um, financing in, in, in the South. We have large, larger flows of private sector capital to the South. Um, both the World Bank, IDB, and other institutions are being squeezed by this. And we have uh, lots of uh, uh, articles in the press about the need to, to re redefine roles, etc. So the question for Richard's ep epistemic community is, should the, the emphasis on, on, on uh, developing an urban agenda be less on the traditional donors, AIDs, et cetera, and more on the new donors, more on the new sources of capital? And does that also imply, indeed, that um, instead of looking at the AIDs of this world, one should really look at, na at national governments more and define an agenda to, to support the introduction of the urban agenda, say, in the South Africa's, the Brazil's, and other countries of this world? Okay. Uh, a, a lot of big questions, uh, and we have very little time, but um, Jessica, do you want to go first? Is that all right? And then sure. Mila? Yeah. Okay, just very quickly. Um, on should donor agency funded programs target where the need is greatest or where we have the most success in our results, um, I think certainly for USAID we have a lot of pressure to demonstrate results and so we, we want to pick the winners. Uh, I'm going to give a very probably undesirable answer, which is it, it shouldn't be an either or. Uh, we, we need to have both. It's not just a matter of picking only the reformers or only the, the winners um, at the expense of places that might have weaker capacity and therefore aren't doing very well or where there may be reform commitment but not the ability to execute it. Um, and if you're, if you're talking about the urban agenda, again, which is a million things to a million different people, um, you can't wholesale forget places where need is, is, is very significant, where um, urban poverty may be the greatest today. So I, I think we have, to, we have to be strategic, and it needs to be, as I said before, a balanced approach, which would include not just where the greatest need is or not just uh, where we know we're going to be able to succeed. So everybody kind of all runs to the same little few select places where we know something's going to happen. Um, on the question of lots of donors, uh, philanthropic and foundations these days, and a whole set of new players, I think that's definitely a question for later. But um, just to say that you know, part of my argument, too, was that we need to, as since I was speaking from the perspective of the donors, uh, and perhaps my title would have been more appropriate than that way, as, a ro as opposed to the role of the international community, which is not just the donors, but is to play that now more facilitative role, which means facilitating and supporting 
national policy level reforms and national governments to embrace an agenda that we can, along with a whole host of other parties, um, engage in to support and to help build the institutions and systems. Um, south to south partnerships versus north to south. I, I don't. I didn't mean to imply that there's there's no place for north-south partnerships, or that donors should step away, but that we need to do more to facilitate south-to-south -south linkages and the transfer of best practice um, or transfer of good practice. Some of the north-south partnerships that USAID has been fo focusing on and supporting for a number of years now used to be called resource cities, now called city links through the International City County Management Association, is I think a very good program that helps, it's a technical twinning arrangement between cities and counties in the U.S. and, and cities and counties or their equivalent in, in the developing world. Um, those are a very particular type of program. But I think we need to, to change our role a bit and not just be focused on bringing the experts from the U.S., bringing the experts from Europe. And when we bring the experts from the U.S., we also have a tendency to think that there is a single U.S. model, which there is not. There's not a single U.S. model for anything. We are a federal system with multiple models of local government, with multiple models of how we address problems. And I think we also need to kind of recognize that. Thanks. Mila? Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, and the thing about the, the news of the impact, just very quickly, I think that uh, is my personal opinion, and I believe that is uh, it's very difficult to choose. You know, obviously, you know, that all our heart is going to, to where the needs are, but you know, eventually, you know, the questions about whether since the small resources we have is more um, uh, is more the more the higher impact. And the, my my question, especially on urban poverty, question is about you know the model of. Uh, uh, targeting, you know, a certain unit or, or just uh, helping the government to take action to leverage. So this is really, uh, I think that, you know, uh, in the World Bank, we are much better equipped really to deal with almost what I call, you know, the slum approach in a boutique. We are really going to a slum and you help, you know, but then you, you, you forget that there is another building that is coming to town. So now I think, you know, one, uh, a better or, or, or a complementary approach would be really to to look at the investment and with all the things, but also you know, to help the national and the local government to see you know, how we can really prevent slums or to go into a more systematic approach you know, to uh, the urban poverty. In terms, you know, of you know the question that was about you know what would be uh, would, would anything change in the World Bank the way they do business? You know, if really you know we go a little bit more into, uh, I, to, I don't think so. I think that the 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 the, the, the economic. Things change, but not radically. You know, I think that the framework of, of growth, you know, and, and public finance, trade opening, all the, the all the fundamental macroeconomic things will be there, like you know, be in IDB or any kind of major organization. The fundamentals of economic growth. What you know, and so with the impact on education, on health, you know, and basic infrastructure, public investment, good. Uh, all the I think that all the, the 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 items will not change. What will change, you know, is is uh, an understanding that things have a special. There is a three dimension that you know they will be reflected. So when you speak about poverty, you have to speak about that there are diff two different poverties and there are two different social conditions. That there and so this is really what my, and for example, certainly things that we were not, never in, in the agenda, maybe in the agenda, the land market is one of them. You know, and this is one other thing that we know that is extremely important source of revenues for the local government. If you do not retax your property, you probably are foregoing an important thing. You know, you really have, when you have urban development projects like in Brazil, you know, if you have uh, an intelligent uh, 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 local government, you can really uh, have the private sector actually financing big urban and even uh, transferring some resources. So the whole thing about land markets, I think, is probably an, an area where really I hope that, you know, the, the fact that you are pushing the urban more in the map will bring more the attentions of the policymakers and of our own analysts. So this would be my major difference. In the PSP, you know, I would see also that you know, uh, after the, the analysis of the overall poverty will be also an opportunity to focus what are the specific characteristics of both large towns, small towns, and rural, and also the transition, you know, and also understanding how economic growth are, and migration are really uh, reshaping the, 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 the concept. So this is my, and about the finance and the, the, the private sector, I think that uh, we are absolutely right. I think we see, uh, and, and we see already f the big institutions like, for example, Rockefeller and Gates, you know, that really are extremely interested in doing development. 
already you know talking you know with IDB talking with the World Bank and seeing you know guys we have billions of money the, the stock market you know is trillions of money this money there is a liquidity in the world this money is available for development how can we help and I think that you know the, uh, the, uh, the so far I don't see that you know uh, even at the level of the community we have been uh, uh, maybe we are starting now. It's just saying, you know, look, you guys come and you help us in specific niche. So I think there is lots, you know, work to be done in that, in that realm. Jessica reminded us of um, why USAID came to the Wilson Center and, and supported CUSP, and it had to do with helping to define what we know and what we don't know about um, the urban condition, and what, a, and therefore some background material towards what appropriate responses are. And as I reflect on this morning's discussion as well as on the previous uh, seminars in the series, I think there are some general observations that can be teased out, which we can explore uh, in slightly greater detail uh, this afternoon. But I would begin with a point that uh, Sue Parnell made about cities being complex and more than the sum of their parts. And we really haven't been able to wrap our minds around that complexity. And we haven't been able to wrap our minds around precisely what happens when we think of the city as something more than just a place, more than just a venue. I think uh, many of the participants uh, in the seminar series would argue uh, that there is uh, an added moment that happens uh, that cities and neighborhoods are more than just places. But we don't really have the intellectual tools to deal with that. And I think that Sue's point uh, is right on target that part of this has to do with the state of social science discourse in the North. Uh, but it also has to do with uh, a lot of other issues uh, which, which came up uh, later in the uh, by, were brought up by Sue and by other speakers. Um, and, and I think one of the lessons that comes out of, of this whole series is that people in development agencies, politicians, and scholars all need to begin to think a little bit harder about what is meant by urban. Now, it will mean different things for each of those groups, but uh, it, one of the reasons why uh, we've had trouble convincing people uh, that urban matters is, in, in fact, that uh, the questions really haven't been posed in a necessarily helpful way. And Richard uh, got us started thinking about this, and he, he talked about the problems of reference points, and he made a very simple point, which leads right back to the, the issue of the scholarship in, in social science, which is uh, it all begins to look a little bit different if you use the South as a reference point rather than the North. And uh, I, I think part of uh, what we hear when, when we hear the discussions from uh, speakers uh, from, the, from various agencies, and, and if we had scholars in the room, uh, uh, the preponderance of, of um, Northern scholarship, it really doesn't begin using the South as the starting point. And this gets to, uh, because this is, um, in a way, the final session of a, a longstanding comparator of urban studies project uh, here at the Wilson Center, Alison Garland and I went back to what started it, which was a discussion group uh, leading up to Habitat 2, preparing for the urban future. And one of the very simple points that came out of that group is there's no such thing as the city. There, there are different pathways to the urban future. There is an urban future, but cities are not all alike. And in that introduction, we talked about five pathways to the urban future. They may or may not have been the right five pathways, uh, but the point is we talk about urban when urban itself is really quite complicated, and we don't grasp the totality of the urban fact. And we don't do that in part, uh, I think we heard this uh, from all our speakers, in part because of our own ignorance. We, there's a lot we just don't know. Um, there's been an absence of research in very serious ways. We don't grasp the totality of the urban fact because we all operate with constricted time frames which don't lend themselves to dealing with uh, the complexity of the larger picture. Uh, and also, running through all of this is politics. 
And it really does, there's a political issue here, which co we come back to time and time again and then skirt around, which has to do with distribution of wealth and power. And that is inescapable, and yet it's kind of hard for uh, people uh, wanting to expand um, assistance uh, to, to really come to terms with that. So I think we have some responses uh, from this morning, which, and we'll hear more of this afternoon, but I think that uh, these are important. One is we need to begin to recalibrate our points of reference to make them a little bit more relevant to what's happening on the ground. We need to think about um, what people in the South have to say. We need to listen. We need to think about South-to-South -South contact. Um, we need to think about donors facilitating those contacts, about, uh, Jessica mentioned associations. So there's, there's this, we need to think a little bit about what, what we mean when we, be, when we easily toss off this notion that urban is very large and complex. What do we really mean by that? What are the relevant issues here? Another very important point, we simply need more research to understand local context. Now, I think many of you in this room understand this. Going to anybody in the private sector, in private philanthropy, in the public sector, and say, we need more research, they throw up their hands and they say, no, we need results. And one thing that I think the scholars have been very, have failed to do is to demonstrate that you actually need to know something before you can go charging off and get results. Now that, now we can easily point our fingers at people sitting behind desks who have budgets and say, well, they should know this, but I also think this is a two-way street and I think scholars have not been very effective at really explaining why we need results. And interestingly, the best answer came from Mila from, from the World Bank, which is, one of the reasons why there's this legacy of, of, uh, of um, uh, uh, privileging rural is th there's a very strong and vibrant field of rural economics that has produced research that allows people to feel as if they can say things that are based on, um, on something that's a little bit more tangible. And, and I think that that gets to the point that uh, research is important for promoting the urban agenda because if we don't have the quality research being done, we're not going to really know what's going on and then we're going to be making appeals that we can't necessarily back up. Um, so I, I, think, um, I, I think there is a theme that runs through all of this. And finally, there are issues of criteria of success. And, and I, I noticed Jessica in passing said, well, what are the stories we have to tell? This, this actually, we need, people who are concerned about urban need, and, and, and maybe this is again addressed more at the academic community, but we need to be able to identify stories that can be told and understood um, in, in more effective ways. And I also uh, found, though, that I think maybe the best single uh, question is the one that Sue asked. Uh, would it be a good thing or a bad thing for my child to live in this neighborhood or in this city? <laughs> And ultimately, that's what people are concerned about. And somehow, we need to build bridges between those kinds of questions. What are the stories? Is it a good thing for my child to live in this neighborhood? And the, um, the research that's done um, by the scholarly community. With those questions in mind, we will break for lunch. We will gather. Uh, we're running a little bit late, but we'll try to gather at about 10 minutes to 1. Uh, and we have two speakers, um, actually we have three speakers, all of whom have been at the Wilson Center, but two of whom have had major uh, real life responsibilities for shaping the urban world and also are scholars. So we thought we would end up with, with a panel of people who might be able to bring together these two often different